Good afternoon. I'm Mandy Cohen, Secretary of the Department of Health and Human Services for North Carolina. With me today is Director Mike Sparberry, Brian Tipton, and Valerie McMillan are our American Sign Language Interpreters. And working behind the scenes are our Spanish interpreters, Jackie and Jasmine Metevier. I'll start with a rundown of the numbers. As of this morning, there are 5,465 cases in 94 counties. 453 people are currently hospitalized, and sadly, there have been 131 deaths. Today, you may have noticed our three-minute video on telehealth playing before this briefing, and we'll play it again at the end of this briefing. We hope that you will share it with, with your viewers and readers. It helps people understand how they can continue to access care that they need while staying home. Doctors and other clinicians across the state have stepped up in a big way to keep serving their patients while protecting them from being exposed from COVID-19. They're using telehealth to deliver primary care and prenatal care, to help patients manage their asthma and diabetes and high blood pressure and other chronic conditions, and provide behavioral health counseling, physical therapy, and more. Telehealth allows people to get healthcare services using a computer, tablet, smartphone, or other approved technology. We know not everyone has a strong internet connection or even a cell phone service, so doctors are finding other creative ways to see their patients remotely. Some practices, for example, have drive-up appointments where patients park in a designated spot and then are provided an iPad to connect with the doctor. Staying home doesn't mean you have to ignore the things that need medical attention. And actually, staying healthy is always important. Right now, it can also help to reduce the risk of serious illness from COVID-19. All insurance companies in the state, including Medicaid and Medicare, are covering healthcare visits through telehealth. If you recently lost your health insurance, are no longer able to afford your coverage, or you're trying to buy health insurance for the first time, there are some options available to you. The easiest way to understand your health insurance options is to go to healthcare.gov. That's healthcare.gov. It will help you if you can, it'll let you know if you can enroll in a private plan and if you qualify for financial assistance. Healthcare.gov will also tell you if you qualify for NC Medicaid or Health Choice. Increasing access to affordable insurance coverage is an important way for us and our state to fight COVID-19. When folks have insurance coverage, they can proactively manage their diabetes or their high blood pressure or get help to quit smoking. So if they do get COVID-19, they'll be more likely to recover at home instead of needing hospital or ICU care. Insurance coverage can also allow families in North Carolina to have the peace of mind that knowing if they get, set, if they get sick, they can pay for the medical care that they need. So as we look ahead to how we stay ahead of the curve, and thank you, we're doing a good job staying ahead of the curve, knowing that this virus is going to be with us for some time, we need to be sure that people can access the care that they need if they test positive to COVID-19 or have any other medical issues. The ability to conduct widespread testing along with aggressive contact tracing and data informed policy decisions are what will be most needed to keep our community safe and protect our frontline workers. Today, you can continue to stay li save lives by staying home and make sure you and your family are in the best health possible. Thanks for all you do. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Director Mike Sprayberry. Thank you, Madam Secretary. The State Emergency Operations Center has now been activated for 38 days for the COVID-19 response. That's now longer than we were here for either Hurricane Matthew or Hurricane Florence. But rest assured, we'll be here as long as it takes to make sure North Carolina is safe from COVID-19. Please allow me to thank all of our local partners of every discipline in every county and the Eastern Band of the Cherokee Indians. 
We know they're working very hard throughout this pandemic to keep their residents safe, and we want them to know that their partnership and hard work is valued and appreciated. We also want to thank the residents of North Carolina for following the restrictions as outlined in the governor's executive orders. Your commitment to staying at home and maintaining social distancing is flattening the curve and ensuring this event is manageable for our health care system. And speaking of health care systems, a special tip of the hat for all of our hospitals, our long-term care facilities, and our medical professionals of all types as they work hard to ensure the state has the capacity to meet the need. Dr. Cohen has been discussing access to health care. An important part of staying healthy is having enough to eat. We're doing a lot to make sure people have food during this pandemic. Some school systems lost their ability to feed children because workers got sick, and in many areas, local restaurants are stepping in to fill the gaps. The Restaurants Feeding Kids program, operated by the Department of Public Instruction, has several counties on board and it continues to grow. We've also formed a food supply chain work group that is working to make sure food availability remains good. This group is led by our good friend and partner, North Carolina National Guard Brigadier General Alan Boyette, and includes representatives from the private sector, academia, the Departments of Agriculture, Health and Human Services, and Public Instruction, plus North Carolina Emergency Management and the North Carolina National Guard. The group is assessing the changing food supply situation in North Carolina and is working to find ways that the state can fill gaps and provide support. Grocers in the private sector and distributors that supply them tell us that the supply chain to supermarkets is strong. However, there is high demand for certain items like meats and toilet paper. Those are brought up or bought up very quickly when stores restock daily. To help alleviate that, we ask that you buy only what your family needs for a week or two and leave enough for others. If you have large supplies, please share with others in your community who have a need. We have a word from the U.S. Department of Agriculture about large shipments of food that will be here in mid-May to support school feeding programs. And we continue to encourage you to support food banks around the state. They're doing great work to support an increasing number of people who need groceries. Visit feedingthecarolinas.org to find a food bank near you. You can make a financial contribution or donation of shelf-stable foods. I also want to take this opportunity to remind everyone of the important messages from Dr. Cohen. For those who have lost work and lost health insurance due to the pandemic, Remember that healthcare.gov is the website to visit for health insurance options and that all insurance companies in the state, including Medicare and Medicaid, are covering health care visits through telehealth. That's good news for the state. In closing, don't forget to look out for your friends and neighbors and call your loved ones daily. Guaranteed they'll appreciate it. With your help, we'll get through this together as one team, one mission, and one family. And now I'm going to turn it back over to my good partner, Dr. Mandy Cohen. Great. Thank you, Director Sprayberry, and thank you for your leadership and your partnership. I'm so appreciative that you continue to bring messages to the public about health and safety, and particularly the link between food security and health. I think that's incredibly important. So with that, I'm going to turn over to your questions. Our reporters on the line, please press one if you'd like to ask a question. We will start with Elizabeth Ann Brown from the Asheville Citizen Times. Hey, Dr. Cohen, this is Elizabeth Ann from the Asheville Citizen Times newspaper. Uh, Y'all have been very transparent since the beginning of the outbreak that the uh, state count on the DHHS website of confirmed cases is preliminary and maybe adjusted both up and down. Uh, however, we saw a couple of days ago that Alamance County plunged in its case count from about 73 to about 45. Um, we've also seen counties like Iredell and a couple others go down one or two consistently every day for the past few days. What, what accounts for those? I, actually, I did not realize that some of our case counts were moving around. And, and we know that as we go through our work, 
our local public health departments are reaching out to every one of our cases, not only to check in on, on their health, but to collect some of the important data that we're then able to share back with you all. Some of our demographic information, the gender, the race and ethnicity. When they're checking back in, it may come about that they realize someone was in one county and not the other, and we clean up that data as we go. So we know that we are making improvements to our data and making sure the quality is good. So that may account for this, the, this change that you're noticing in daily counts per, per county, but I'll have our team follow up with you specifically to make sure that, that that is the reason. But do know we are always checking back with these cases, updating the data, and that may be why you see it might have been attached to one county and then we realize based on their address or, or what have you um, it might be another county so we'll, we'll get back to you about that but thanks for the question the next question is from Garrett Bergquist with Spectrum News Good afternoon, Dr. Cohen. Uh, yesterday uh, you and Governor Roy Cooper outlined what you're looking at in terms of when and to what extent we can reopen the state's economy. Of course, President Trump expected to uh, unveil some new guidelines on that today. In terms of the testing and statistics that you brought up yesterday, what specific benchmarks are you looking for? And from, in, at least in your case, from a public health perspective, how are you weighing the economic costs of staying closed with the public health risk of reopening? Gary, uh, what a great question and, and a hard one because these are, are challenging times and we're in an unprecedented space here. In terms of testing, we are trying to increase our capacity so that we can make sure that we are able to, to trace new cases that we have as well as their contacts and then be able to test. So we think that we need to probably double the amount of capacity of testing that we have going on right now. I think we have a plan in place to do that, but it's not only going to take our collaboration in the private and public sector to do it. Testing also re relies on supplies, um, not just the supplies of the tests themselves, but the protective equipment for our healthcare workers that are administering those tests. That is where we need the help of the federal government and continued work with our manufacturing sector to make sure that we can have the supply chain there to actually run the tests as we increase our testing capabilities. Um, we also want to diversify the kinds of tests that we have. Right now, we are largely rel relying on tests that, that take about 24 to 36 hours to come back. Um, they're high throughput labs. We also want to make sure that we're intermixing different kinds of tests, like point of care testing that can be done more rapidly, um, that takes 15 minutes to a half hour. They don't, they're not able to do a lot in, at a time, but they are able to do some quickly. So I think it'll be the mix of those things together that allows us to increase our testing capacity. And again, we want to do the tracing of positives and their contacts and then be able to test those. We want to still be focusing our testing on our healthcare workers that might have had an exposure, those that are hospitalized, and those that are that we see outbreak situations like our nursing homes and other congregate facilities. So that's still our focus, but we want to be able to um, ramp up um, our testing beyond that. And as we think about how do we put together the economic impacts, the health impacts, and make decisions here, we're going to be looking at a number of things as the governor laid out. Um, he overall said it was in trends. We're going to be looking at things like the case counts, our death, death rate day over day, our hospitalizations, um, and other factors like that. I think we need to have the foundation of the testing and the tracing, our hospital surge planning, our protective equipment, and then look at these numbers and understand what do we think um, is appropriate. Um, we hope to see additional guidance. We hear that it is coming, as you mentioned, from the federal government. We'll incorporate that all into our thinking as we move forward. Thanks for your question. Next question is from Jonathan Alexander with the News and Observer. Uh, hi, uh, Dr. Cohen. Um, Speaker uh, Moore made some remarks um, that there were that there was extra PPE lying around. I'm wondering what do you make of that that remark from Speaker Moore? I don't know if I fully heard. I think you said that there was PPE lying around. I 
I will say that we you know we've been working very hard, and I'll have Director Sprayberry speak more um, about our work to uh, not only work with our federal partners as well as private sellers and our manufacturing sector to get um, personal protective equipment here. Um, I will say we, as Director Sprayberry has mentioned in a number of news conferences this week, we've had a better week. Um, we've had some supplies come in, and then we've been pushing that out to our our partners across the state, and that's been a good thing. Um, but yes, we. We want to get that uh, the, that protective equipment out to those that are that that need it, but we also want to make sure we're bringing in more because folks are are using that protective equipment and and it's a consumable, meaning they use it up and then they need new. Um, so that is ongoing, continued work, and that that is that fill that. Uh, uh, that goes with how we're going to be able to proceed forward here in reopening. If we're going to ramp up testing um, and our, our tracing capacity, we need to have the protective equipment um, that is needed. But why don't I turn it over to Director Sprayberry for more on uh, the personal protective equipment. Right. And thank you, Dr. Cohen. And thanks for the question. As uh, she just mentioned, we're going to need uh, not only personal protective equipment for our ongoing operations currently, but as we continue to ramp up testing as part of the uh, testing, tracing, and, and uh, trending uh, as we look to, you know, see how things are moving towards the future and get ahead of the curve, we're going to need a large supply of personal protective equipment. To that end, we have uh, grown our uh, purchasing uh, section and we are working with not just uh, normal purchasers uh, within emergency management and the Department of Health and Human Services. We brought in some National Guard partners. And so um, we're working uh, very aggressively to uh, call vendors. And you might imagine that we've gotten a lot of calls from vendors ourselves. Uh, but we're working very closely. Um, and we have begun to see some shipments uh, from those vendors. As you might uh, know, uh, we also received uh, three allocations from the Strategic National Stockpile. And so what happens when we receive items? We've already got a distribution formula worked out. They hit the warehouses, and then uh, what they do is what I call a pivot and push. And it's uh, my direction as the CERT leader is that once we receive something, we want to get it out to the end user as quickly as possible. So uh, we try to get it to our eight healthcare preparedness coalitions, which represent the 124 hospitals in this state. And we also uh, push out to our county partners. Yesterday, we had 49 shipments. So we are in this, and we are working hard to get as much PPE as possible. We know there's a need for it now. We know there'll be a need for it in the future. And so we are working hard to get as much as we can and then pushing it out very quickly. Thank you very much. Great, thank you. Next question. Next question is from Chandler Morgan with WBTV in Charlotte. Hi, this is Chandler Morgan with WBTV in Charlotte. I kind of have a two-part question. The first one could be for either of you. Um, is there any update on conversations being had with state leaders about school closure extensions at this point? Um, many schools aren't set to go back until mid-May, just wondering what that looks like. And then um, my second question would be for Director Sprayberry. The Sand Hill Regional Medical Center that was set to reopen as a field hospital, um, is that still on track? Is that still going to be needed? I know that a lot of field hospitals, at least here in Mecklenburg County, the one that was requested is no longer set to be needed. Well, thanks, Chandler. Let me answer your first question about school closures. So I said, yes, that is one of the many things that we are looking at to understand how do we smartly and appropriately phase back in uh, certain things as we move forward? Again, that's going to rely on us having the appropriate testing, having the appropriate ability to trace, and then looking at our data and to use that data to inform our decision making. Um, I know that this virus is going to be with us until we have a vaccine. Um, so these are the kind of decisions that we need to think about. And no matter what we do, we know components of reopening, whether it's a business or a school is going to involve some amount of social distancing and the, the tried and true things that we've been talking about since day one, washing your hands, 
deep cleaning, uh, wiping down surfaces, a respi- you know, the sneezing into your, into your uh, elbow, all those things are going to still can play a part of our role and are going to be part of our new normal because the virus is going to be with, with us. And as we think about those trends as well, I want folks to understand that we, we will look at things over time. If we open up some things and we see things trending the wrong way or we see hot spots, we may need to say, you know what, we have to actually close back down again um, in certain places and, and in certain ways. So I think this will be an ongoing uh, situation that we will continue to evaluate using the data uh, that is coming in and trying to make the best decisions we can for the state of North Carolina to protect citizens' health and safety. Uh, on the second question related to Sandhills, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Director Sprayberry. Thank you, Dr. Cohen, and thank you, ma'am, for the question. Yes, ma'am, that's true. Uh, we uh, did a walkthrough of the Sandhills uh, Regional Facility yesterday, and we anticipate um, having the lease completed here in the next day or so. And what we look at, we lo- are looking at this as kind of like an insurance policy in the event that we need medical surge capacity. And, um, and we are going to start to work once we get the lease uh, executed to get, it, um, to get it set up to accept patients. And so um, that is part of the plan. Uh, back to what you said about Charlotte, that is correct. Uh, they did decide um, based on uh, their planning for medical surge capacity Uh, within their hospital walls and also within uh, other places like uh, ambulatory uh, centers that they might have or specialty centers that they could surge the required number of beds that they thought that they might need based on the the current modeling so that they wouldn't have to execute a field hospital. Now, having said that, we do remain in close conversations with uh, both Atrium and Novant so in the event that something would change in the forecast or we begin to see different trends, uh, we, can, we still have a plan in place to execute an alternate care site should that be needed. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Our next question is from Lee with the Wilson Times. Um, Hey, Dr. Cohen, uh, this is Olivia with the Wilson Times. I'm just wondering if you can tell me why DHHS is not releasing uh, basic information like the number of positive cases from state-owned nursing facilities where a current outbreak is occurring, like the one at Longleaf Neuro Medical Center in Wilson. Thanks for the question, Olivia. So we're doing the as much as we can to release a lot of data. So the data that we are able to release related to nursing homes is posted daily on our dashboard. When we see two or more cases, which we call an outbreak, we do track those and we report that not only that the outbreak is happening, but the county in which it is happening. The case count is very challenging because as we've talked about with this virus, it is quite contagious and it moves quickly. So those numbers are current, are, are rapidly uh, changing. Um, so th- those are not numbers that we're able to post on a day-to-day basis. Um, some of the facilities are able to share those numbers um, and our local health departments are working closely with all of those facilities to help them do the work to isolate uh, the cases that are positive to prevent further spread. We've done a lot of work um, in our nursing home space to both try to prevent viruses from getting into those facilities. Again, we know that those are high risk settings as well as to work on once a virus might be there, how do we think about isolating and using the protective equipment that we need um, as well as rapid testing uh, to make sure that we are containing, containing the virus and we'll continue to do that. Thanks for the question. Our next question is from Andrea Blanford, ABC 11. Hi, Dr. Cohen. It's Andrea Blanford with ABC 11. A question for you about testing and data. Um, Curious how many pending tests are still in the queue as of right now. I think you said that you are able to get results turned around in 24 to 36 hours, but if you could clarify that. And, um, and then do you have any data right now on just how many people have recovered across our state? Thanks. Great. 
Thanks for those questions, Andrea. So on testing, we are able to share the, the completed testing numbers. We certainly share all the positives. On the negatives, we get nearly what we think is, is, the, is a representative sample. We probably don't get them all. That is not something required, but most labs do report their, their negatives to us. We're something over 70,000, 70, 75,000 um, as of today. We are seeing, uh, you know, much better turnaround times of, of that testing. We were seeing, we are having no pending tests at our state lab, at our state public health lab. Um, we know that we've been in close contact with LabCorp. They did have some pending tests for for a couple of weeks there, but actually now they have um, very quick throughput and don't seem to have any any uh, tests that are pending, at least not from North Carolina. So things are improving on the testing side, uh, testing side, and that's a really good thing. But we still want to increase our testing capacity and make sure that we are getting to um, as many folks as we can, particularly um, in places like outbreaks um, and others. We want to make sure that we're testing so that we can uh, know who's been in contact and that we could do even more testing and, again, to slow the spread of this virus. So we can, we'll continue to do that. On the recovery side, that's a question we've been hearing a lot. We've been working with um, our partners at the CDC and in other states to define how, how are we defining recovery? Because we know that folks have had COVID-19. I've had folks in my own family who have had that and, and have recovered now. So how do we know and how do we document a, a recovery number? We've asked the CDC this question to, so we don't all define recovery in different ways just based on the state. So we're trying to figure out how we as, as a country can all define recovery so we have that sort of standardization and not apples to oranges if we define it in different ways. So know that we are, our scientists are trying to figure out a way in which we could report recovery in a reliable way, um, in a tracking way, but we don't, don't have that ability yet, but just know that is something we have asked our CDC partners to work on uh, with us. We haven't really seen other countries or other, other places around the world report recovery numbers in, in, in that way. So I think everyone is struggling exactly how to do that in a reliable way. So stay tuned as we try to do some more work on that. The next question is from Steve Devane with the Fayetteville Observer. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, hi, Dr. Cohen. Uh, my question is about rural hospitals. And uh, I was wondering, you know, most of the cases have obviously been uh, concentrated in urban areas. So my question is whether or not anything is being done. Is there any concern that uh, about spread or hot spots in rural areas, and what are you telling um, uh, rural hospitals to do in this uh, instance? And what is the, is there any concern since uh, with the uh, lack of access to care in some areas? Thank you. Steve, thanks for the question. Uh, you know, focus on access to care has been a centerpiece of the work that I've done well before COVID-19. Access to care in rural areas is always a challenge uh, given the nature of their, their communities. Um, but we've been working very closely with our rural partners and rural hospitals. Let me start on the financing side because that is a real challenge I know for our rural providers. Um, they've seen a drop in the number of people coming through their doors as we've asked folks to stay home uh, and uh, they've, they've put off some of their elective procedures. Um, so we know that there's some financial issues there, but we have been trying to work with them through our Medicaid program to get um, additional dollars out to our rural hospitals, offering hardship payments um, and other ways to move up some of our payments from the state to help them out financially. Financially. So that's one related to rural hospitals. But as we think about them as a, an important component of response effort and our, and our surge efforts, many of our rural hospitals don't have uh, intensive care unit type capability, but they do have inpatient capability. So we're doing a lot of work to make sure our rural hospitals are connected with our, uh, our larger hospital systems that do have that intensive care capability and more ventilators. So in case someone who they are caring for does get sick, how do we think about moving patients around? Around. But we want to make sure we're using our rural hospitals for the important care that they can give. Um, and so I think they're, they're at a component of our overall med surge planning effort, um, whether that's needing to move certain patients out of their facility so they can get cared for where there's ventilators and other intensive care, but then potentially to discharge people from 
from larger hospitals to those rural hospitals, potentially closer to their home, um, that where they can be cared for um, as well. So I think it's more of a patient movement planning um, that's been going on with our rural hospitals. But first, we have to work on the, the financial piece and make sure that they, they are able to stay open. Um, I want to go back to that access to insurance coverage. We know that our rural areas are much more are, are much more likely to have folks that are uninsured in our rural areas, and that certainly puts them um, at greater risk um, when we come when it comes to COVID-19. We know our rural areas see greater um, chronic diseases that are uncontrolled, as I was talking about earlier, like diabetes and high blood pressure. This is where I'm hoping our, our, our folks in rural areas, you know, make sure that you are, if you have insurance, great, reach out to your doctors to control your chronic diseases. If you don't have insurance, opportunities to potentially apply for insurance right now. And we certainly want to be doing more to improve access to care as we go forward. Thanks for the question. Our last question today will be from Ken Smith with WRAL. Uh, Dr. Cohen, Ken Smith with Ariel, thanks for taking my call. Listen, you're making the point about uh, making sure that people stay healthy. Uh, were you seeing that, um, were you concerned that many of the cases that are coming in recently, uh, that uh, the folks weren't necessarily paying enough attention to their health, and were you concerned that maybe insurance has something to do with it? Thanks for that question. So what the data from early um, uh, cases of COVID-19, largely outside of North Carolina, but, it, but across the United States, the CDC had changed their guidance on who was high risk. At first, they were talking about just folks with um, underlying chronic disease, but they, they went further to say unmanaged chronic diseases actually puts you at higher risk. So unmanaged or a high sugars if someone has blood, blood um, sorry, if they have diabetes or unmanaged high blood pressure are really the things that, that are putting folks at risk. So um, they, they further qualified not just having the chronic disease, but if that chronic disease is not well controlled with medications um, over time, that is actually puts you at, at, at greater risk. So that is why the emphasis on wanting to make sure those of us who have chronic diseases are reaching out to our, our doctors they're available to you. They can be reached by telehealth. That telehealth is covered by insurance here in North Carolina. So that's why we want to encourage folks not to neglect some of their chronic conditions while they're staying at home. I'm so appreciative of everyone staying at home, um, but we want to make sure that folks are in the best health they possibly can be. I'll put in a plug for, for smoking. For those smokers out there, if you've ever been thinking about quitting, now is the best time to do that. There, is, there are resources available for you, a quit line. Um, that can help you uh, quit smoking, as well as call on your doctor and say, hey, hey, doc, it's time. I want to quit. Because we know COVID-19 is a lung disease, right? It, it, it affects folks with a cough. And then those get, that get very sick, obviously, are having trouble breathing in a lung disease. And if you uh, can stop smoking now and even, even bring your, your, your lungs into some better health um, in, in the short term, even just two or three months of no smoking really does help improve the health of your lungs. Um, that's a great thing. So we just want to encourage folks to use, the, use their primary care doctors, to use their insurance to stay well, and so that if they do come down with COVID-19, they're going to be in the best position to fight it off and not actually need to go to the hospital or the intensive care unit. And we we know that folks who have access to insurance coverage are more likely to go to the doctor. So all the pieces sort of fit together. Having the insurance card makes you more likely to go to the doctor. If you go to the doctor, you're managing your chronic illnesses, and then you're going to ultimately be in a better place to fight off COVID-19 if you should be exposed and, and get the virus. So that is the message of the day, and we're going to play for you again our telehealth video um, with a number of our wonderful doctors from around North Carolina uh, showing you different ways in which they're connecting with their patients. I hope you share this with your, um, with your viewers and your readers. And for those of you watching directly, make sure you stay well, stay home to save lives. Thanks so much.